Art can be captivating and beautiful, an expression immortalised. Is it just paint though? Or could there be more behind the canvas than you might expect? It's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I got this package in the mail from my dad. Brown paper wrapping, large but flat, with the word fragile written on it in black ink. When I unwrapped it, it was this big acrylic painting, framed in some sort of bronze gilded plaster. The painting itself was of this long hallway full of doors, kind of like you'd see in a fancy hotel. The walls had edging about halfway up. The upper part was painted sort of an off-white, while the lower half was a crimson red that blended into the carpeting. Between each door was an upturned light as well as on the far wall at the end, where the corridor seemed to be connected to another hallway running perpendicular to it, disappearing around a corner. It was really amazing detail, though I wouldn't call it lifelike by any means. Just the sheer amount of intricate pieces to each aspect of the scene showed that the artist really paid attention to every little thing. Like somewhere in the world was this hallway, and you could stand in it and hold the painting up in front of you. And if it weren't for the border and the clearly stylized art, you wouldn't be able to tell where the canvas ended and where the real world began. I called him up and thanked him immediately. But where do you find this? I got it at an auction. I kind of figured as much. So I hung up the painting in my office, just behind my desk, which I realized later wasn't the best place for it. Because in order to actually look at it, I had to swivel completely around, but there wasn't anywhere better really. And once I'd gotten it hung up, I felt less willing to take it down. So I just left it there. It kind of hung out over my shoulder and watched me work. And every once in a while, I'd turn around and stare at it and get entranced by it, feeling like I could get up and put my hands in the frame and climb into the painting as if it were a window. Of course, I wouldn't be writing this if something weird didn't happen as a result of the painting. We had a couple of friends over, Mark and Sabina. Mark and I went into my office when the women folk started talking about knitting, which has become my wife's new favorite hobby. I went and sat down at my laptop to find a video that I had been telling Mark about. And Mark wandered over and started admiring the painting. Where did you get that? My dad bought it for me in an auction and gave it to me. It's creepy. It's not that creepy. It's kind of, uh, I don't know, hypnotic? Yeah. I turned around to look at it with him while the video loaded. He got up close and was running his finger over the canvas, feeling the raised acrylic. And I just let my gaze wander over all the details again. Huh? I didn't notice that before. What? At the end of the hall, there was some sort of light coming from around the corner, and it's casting a shadow on the floor. 
I got up and looked closer, because I really hadn't spent a lot of time studying the far end of the hallway. There was definitely something yellow, and some darker colours, making what looked like the shadow of a person coming from around the corner. I even reached out and touched it, to make sure it wasn't some trick of the light in the study, making it just look like there was the shadow in the painting. But I felt the paint, and sure enough, it was there actually in the painting. See what I mean? Mark said. Creepy. I genuinely felt weirded out by it. It was one of those moments when you start thinking, why didn't I notice this earlier? Was it there to notice? A couple of days passed. I was working on a project in my study, and it was round about 9.30pm at night. And I just couldn't focus. So I spun around in my chair to look at the painting. And I felt this sudden vertigo effect, like the ground wasn't there. And I had to grab my chair to keep me from tumbling into emptiness. You wouldn't have noticed it if you hadn't looked at the painting a hundred times like I had. The hallway was long, with exactly six doors. I remember because I counted them on the first day. Three on the left, three on the right, each with a little shiny metal doorknob. Only now, there were seven doors, three on the left, and four on the right. It didn't make sense. Everything looked proportionally exactly the same and the far end of the corridor was just as far. And yet, there was a fourth door in the right side of the hallway, with its own little metal doorknob. I don't even know which door was the fourth door, and how well it blended in. I just know that there were four doors, where once there were three. What the hell is going on? I turned away in my chair, and back to check several times, to make sure that my eyes were not playing tricks on me. But the number of doors remained constant. I called my dad again and I asked him, Is this a trick painting you sent me? What do you mean? I mean, it keeps changing. I can see it changing. Not as far as I know. It was just one in a bunch I picked up all at the same auction. After I got off the phone, I took the painting down and checked the back for some sort of mechanical or digital hocus pocus. But it was all soft canvas. So I left it on the floor behind my office chair, with the painting facing the wall, because the thought of it was thoroughly freaking me out. The next day, I pulled my wife into my office, and held the painting up so that she could see it, because she hadn't had a chance to before. How many doors are there? I asked. She looked over it for a moment. Seven. When I first got this, there were six. She just looked at me as if I were being a goofball. Okay, so which one wasn't there before? I have no idea. You don't know which door magically appeared? And she laughed and gave me a kiss, and went back into the other room. It gets worse. The next time I chatted with Mark, I told him about the extra door in the painting. Are you sure there weren't seven doors to begin with? Well, I would swear I counted six. Well, if another one shows up, at least Melissa counted seven, and can confirm it then. You know what you should do? You should take a photo of the painting, 
so that you could prove if anything else changes. What a great idea. So I got my phone out and took a photo of the painting. Two days went by, nothing. On the third day, I walked into my office and there was a man staring at me. Well, I mean, it wasn't. I can't say that it was a man or woman. Hell, I can't say that it was human. There was a shape at the end of the hallway in my painting. It was oddly lacking in the detail that the rest of the painting had. Like someone had hurriedly painted it on. I even ran my hand over it to make sure that it wasn't fresh, that someone hadn't actually come in and painted over my painting to drive me crazy. It was really there. And the look of it scared me more than anything else. Changing painting included. I wish I could do it the justice with words, but the best I can describe it is that it was human-ish, with legs and arms, but it seemed squat or hunched and lopsided, like someone had slapped a blurry Quasimodo on an otherwise beautiful painting. You couldn't see the details in its face, but you could see shading on it. Definitely really warped features. I was almost glad that there wasn't more detail to it, except that it just left enough to the imagination to give one nightmares. But I had proof. Here was the proof that the painting was changed. So I brought up the file on my laptop to show my wife for comparison. Only when I did, the figure was in the photo I took too. At no point did I start questioning my sanity about all this. Something unnatural and terrifying was going on. So I took the painting out of the house and set it on the curb where we put our trash for pickup. I was done with that painting. Or so I thought. The next evening, when I got in home from work, it was gone from the curb. I figured someone had seen it and taken it home. And I waved my hand and said, Good. Now, it's someone else's problem. I went in, played with my daughter, had dinner, and put her to bed. And after watching a show in my wife, I resumed and went back into my office to check my mail. No, the painting wasn't back on the wall. I made sure of that the moment that I walked through the door. But I got a message from Mark, asking if the painting had changed any more. And I told him about the creepy addition, and also how I had gotten rid of the painting. Oh man, that sounds cool. I wish I'd gotten a chance to see it. Well, I can send you the photo I took of it. Cool. So I opened the image file. The thing in the painting now had raised arms. Before you could only barely make out the arms hanging at its sides, but now both arms were raised up over its head and its fingers were spread apart like it were waving hello at me. I think it was waving hello at me. I zoomed in as best I could without pixelating the image and the shaded contours of the face seemed stretched into a grin. Oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. I sent Mark the file, but the connection kept glitching. So I put it in a folder on my Dropbox account and gave him access. The files corrupted, he texted me. I tried to open it as well, but he was right. Every time I tried to copy the image file, somehow, it got corrupted. It must be the spooky magic, Mark joked. This is no joke. I'm freaking out here. Delete the file if it's scaring you so badly. So I deleted the file. 
But it gnawed at me, you know. The painting was still changing in horrible, terrifying ways, seemingly acknowledging my observations of it. And now it was gone. But if it was gone, why should it matter? If something unholy happens, it's the problem of whoever has the painting now, right? And they'll see it changing too, won't they? Oh shit. It was two days later, and I was organising a folder of documents and had accidentally deleted a couple that I hadn't meant to. I went into the Windows recycling bin, and you guessed it, there was the image file along with the documents. I had to look. I was trembling with dread at the thought of it. But when something so surreal happens to you, you have to witness it to see it through to the end. I recovered the file and opened it. The walls of the hallway seemed to be melting. The partition separating the red from the off-whites was lower than it had been before, and drooped in places. The ridge on the lights looked like they were peeling off. The carpet seemed less crimson and more reddish brown, and the figure had taken several steps down the long corridor towards the viewer's perspective. More details had become defined, hair hanging off its head, long and black, like it had been painted on with a fine-tipped brush. The eyes were little more than dull black points under the shading of the brow. The grin came with teeth, uneven and fat, like those of a child more than of an adult. Its arms were extended out on either side of it, touching both walls. One foot was ahead of the other, as if I had caught it mid-step in a game of red light, green light. I realised I was panting and shaking as I looked at it. It was really hard to breathe, an anxiety attack. The painting was going to make me pass out, just from looking at a digital photo of it. Quickly, I closed the image to calm myself down. But that suddenly brought forth the thought. What if it progresses every time I look away? The only way to stop is to keep looking. And I opened the file again. No change. Oh no, wait. There wasn't a new change. I had noticed it before. But it hadn't dawned on me. One of the doors was open. There was a dim blue light coming from the room inside. Moonlight, I thought. And just outside the threshold of the door, there was an object lying on the floor. I zoomed in for better detail. It was a little yellow stuffed lion, with a scraggly orange mane, a child's toy. Of all of the details, the melting hallway, the grinning fiend with arms wide open, the blue light from the open doorway, it was the innocent nature of that little toy lion that filled me with the most dread. My wife came into the office. Come kiss Gabby goodnight. I went into her darkened room, where she was wrapped up in the blankets in her bed, hugging a half dozen stuffed animals, and looking cute as could be. My little darling, I loved her so much. I kissed my daughter goodnight. She kissed me back, and hugged her little pillow pet, with the built-in nightlight. It glowed through a variety of colours. I love you, baby, I told her. Can you get my Simba? I looked around. Where did you leave it? Over there, 
She pointed to the closet. The door was open, and her toy lay on the floor just inside. Simba, her little yellow stuffed lion with the scraggly orange mane. Seeing it lying there, just past the threshold of the closet door, while the dim glow of my daughter's nightlight faded from red to purple to blue, I felt my heart rise up in my chest. The closet was just a closet. I could see it was just a closet. There were clothes on hangers and bags with toys and blocks in them. They were right there. And yet, as I looked at the stuffed lion lying on the floor, waiting for me, I felt as if I could see the carpet on the floor inside the closet, even though there was none, carpeting not in my vision but in my imagination. And maybe, if I went in and shut the door, I would find that the walls beyond those clothes had a wooden partition, red below, off-white above. And maybe, there was something hunched and terrible, shambling its way towards us even as I stood there staring at the toy. I walked, briskly trying not to look, half as frightened as I was, snatched up Simba, and shut the closet door. My breathing was heavy, like I'd just run a mile, and I struggled to avoid gasping for breath as I tried to calm myself down. Hey, did that poster fall down? I asked nobody in particular, then pretended I was just trying to adjust a cat poster that had been on the floor by her dresser for months, and shoved the heavy dresser over it so that it partially blocked the closet door. Here's Simba, sweetie. I handed the line to Gabby, gave her a quick hug and a kiss, and wished her good night before rushing back to my office. The painting had changed, as I knew it would. The open door was closed, the toy gone from the floor. The hallway was dimly lit, with yellow light from the melting lights again. But the thing, that not-quite-human fiend, was standing right outside the now-shut door. Its body turned to face it, with both hands pressed up against the door itself, like it was running its hands down it, caressing it and it had its head turned towards me. Still grinning, that awful, frightening grin full of gnashed, crooked teeth. Oh God, how close had it been? No, it's just a closet. The hallway's not there. It's not real. None of this is real. I've put up signs around the neighborhood, locked the doors, asked everyone I know, and many that I don't, if they know who took the painting. I need to find it. I need to get it back. I want to tear it, shred it in my hands, throw it in a fire, and watch it burn to ashes. Jesus, God in heaven, I hope it didn't end up in some landfill. I've learnt the awful truth. All doors lead to the hallway. So, what are we doing here? We're, uh, appreciating art. How do you appreciate art? I think you just stand there and look at it. That's it? Yeah, pretty much. Danny, we're standing at a nine-foot painting of a triangle. No offence. But even your hipster girlfriend knew this was bullshit. Which is why she crapped out of going, and you dragged me along? I blew air at my bangs from the bottom of my mouth. All right, I said. 
Let's go get drunk. Jason grinned, and we started walking towards the exit. That's more like it. You know that beard makes you look like a douchebag? I think it makes me look manly, and Karen likes it. Manly? Danny, you look like the kind of guy who owns a special little comb for picking semen out his beard. How long did it take you to come up with that one? About as long as it took you to- Whoa, hold on. Look at this one. Jason had stopped in front of a small painting of a face. Shit. The painting was the bust of a woman, and looked like something out of the Renaissance. It was strangely out of place in the modernist gallery around us. Look at her eyes, Danny. Holy shit, I'm doing it. I'm appreciating art. The woman's eyes were sky blue and they bore a sort of dreamy expression, which only seemed to enhance the strangeness of her beauty. It gives me the creeps, I said. It looks like she's naked. Do you think they've got a painting of the rest of her? Seriously, it's creeping me out, let's go. But as we turned around to go, we were approached by a woman with wire-rimmed glasses and hair pulled back so tight that her forehead was reflecting the gallery lights. Do you like this one? She asked. I, uh, yeah, my friend likes it. Jason was too busy oogling the painting to respond. Who painted it? I asked. An unknown renaissance artist. It was donated to the gallery and we display it here to demonstrate the contrast between modern and traditional forms of art. Is it for sale? Jason asked. You seemed really taken with it, the gallery owner smiled. Go on and take it. Maybe it can inspire a love of art in you. Wait, are you serious? I asked. Jason shrugged and lifted the painting off the wall. Come on, sexy. You're coming with me. I can't believe you bought a painting to a bar. It's called peacocking, Danny. Whatting? It's when you bring something flashy to a bar to attract the attention of women. Sounds like a good idea. You want the girls to think you're some kind of psycho, right? Shit, that could work. Maybe I can hook up with one of those girls that writes letters to serial killers in prison. Besides, I wanted to look at it some more. I've always had a thing for green eyes. Are you drunk already? She's got blue eyes, dipshit. Dude, get your vision checked. This must be why you're such a shitty driver. You think all the traffic lights are blue. I was just about to tell Jason what a dumbass he was when a girl walked up to us and interrupted. Cool painting, she said. It's mine. Jason puffed out his chest, perhaps taking the word peacocking a little too literally. I really like the expression in her eyes, the girl went on. So vulnerable. It's like she's really bearing her soul. Yeah, Jason eagerly agreed. But there's something more, like a fierceness. It's beautiful. The girl looked at the painting quizzically. I don't see it, she said. Jason and the girl went on talking while I drained my whiskey and started texting Karen that Jason had met a girl and was ignoring me again. He was always like this around pretty girls. He said he fell in love at least twice a day. Eventually, they went off to her apartment and I went home to the dorm. I woke up on the couch the next morning with a splitting headache. Jason must have gotten home last night, sometime after I passed out, because his coat was on the rack. As I became more aware of my surroundings, I noticed a powerful burning smell. I jumped up and saw smoke billowing out the oven. Jason, you idiot, I grumbled. This wasn't the first time he'd stuck a pizza in the oven and then passed out before it was done. 
I switched off the oven and went to pound Jason's door. Hey, wake up, numbnuts. You nearly burnt us alive again last night. No answer. What a lazy prick. I turned the knob and saw that he was still in bed, but obviously awake. Hey, idiot, I said. Get up and clean the... But the words died in my throat. As I got closer, I saw the black pool of blood that had spilled from his mouth. His eyes were wide open. And still... Shit. I ran over and shook him. But he was already ice cold. When the ambulance got there, they took him away in a bag. They asked me if I knew what happened, but I couldn't answer. I just kept going over this same thing in my mind. Jason had brown eyes. I was sure of it. But when I found him lying there in a pool of his own blood, his eyes had been green. The next week was a blur for me. I numbly floated through the days. People's consolation and pitying looks were just mundane platitudes that could not reach me. The university held a memorial service for Jason. They printed out a big version of the picture from his student ID and placed it next to the arts building so people could come by and pay their respects. I went the long way around the building to avoid seeing it. I didn't want to be reminded of what had happened, but I couldn't hide from it forever. After class on Friday, there was an urgent knock at my door. And when I opened it, Karen was standing there looking upset. I tried calling you, she said. Are you okay? I shrugged. I'm surviving, I guess. Have you... Karen seemed nervous about something been by the arts building? Not recently, why? I, uh, I don't want to upset you, but I figured it had best come from me. What are you talking about? Karen pulled up a picture on her phone and handed it to me. What the hell? It was Jason's picture by the arts building, but someone had gorged out the eyes then spray-painted a big red X over his face. Who the hell would do something like this? I asked. I don't know, but the university police are looking into it. A thought had been nagging at the back of my mind for days now. I grabbed my keys off the hook and marched out to the parking lot. Where are you going? I heard Karen calling after me. I'm going to go back to that bloody art gallery. I'm not sure what I would expect to find. An answer, I guess. Some sort of closure. But I definitely didn't expect to find what I did. Hanging right there, in the very same spot, was the painting of the blue-eyed woman. I couldn't believe my eyes. I just stood there staring at it. Do you like this one? I heard a voice behind me to see the owner of the art gallery. Oh, she said. You're back. Where did you get this? I sputtered out. The gallery owner stroked the painting's cheek. She seems to always find her way. I think she misses her spot on the wall. I felt something in me break. An emotional numbness was replaced by a flood of anger. I grabbed the woman's collar and yanked her towards me. I know it was you. I know what you did, I said while shaking her. Are you going to hurt me? She asked. Her eyes moved over towards the painting, and I followed them. The painting's eyes were now a brilliant shade of green. I gasped and let go of her collar and watched as the eyes slowly changed back to blue. The gallery owner straightened her shirt. I don't decide who she goes home with. She does. I started to back away slowly, 
and the gallery owner watched me. I could have sworn the painting was watching me too as I turned around and ran. When I got home, Karen was waiting for me, worry written all over her face. Danny, what's going on? I don't know, but I know who killed Jason. You do? It was the gallery owner, I said. The place we were in last week? The gallery owner? Why would the gallery owner kill Jason? Because she's crazy. She's some kind of witch, Karen. Karen frowned. Are you feeling okay? Jason died in bed, Danny. Why? Do you think he was murdered? I just... You didn't see it. The painting. I trailed off. Even I could hear how crazy the words sounded as they would come out of my mouth. I knew what I'd seen, but I knew no one else would believe me. <sighs> Nothing. Sorry, I'm just a little upset. Never mind. Let's relax for a while. Do you want to watch a movie? I agreed more for Karen's sake than my own. After all, I was sure I'd just frightened her. We set up the movie, and Karen went off into the bathroom like she always did at the start of movies. While she was inside, I saw a text message from her friend Brittany pop up on her phone. Karen didn't mind when I read her messages, so I grabbed the phone and swiped it open. All the messages said was, Have you told him about Jason yet? I heard the toilet flush, and the faucet go on, and then Karen walked back in and plopped right down next to me. What is this? I held the phone up to her face. It's nothing, Danny. Why don't we talk about it when you're feeling better? No, something's going on and I want to know what the hell it is. Karen sighed. All right. After they put Jason's picture up, there were some rumors that started going around. Rumors? What rumors? Some girls said some things about Jason assaulting them. And then more girls started to come forward. The police looked into it, Danny. And they're saying... They're saying what? <sighs> they're saying his DNA ties back to open rape cases a couple of years ago. What? I'm sorry, Danny. I know he was your friend. It felt like all the air had rushed out the room. There was no way it could be true. Jason had always been a bit of a chauvinist, but he was no rapist. Was he? A few weeks later, the dust had settled, and the truth had come out about Jason. I felt like he had died a second time. All of my good memories of him were now replaced by some sick feeling. I couldn't even begin to untangle them. Seventeen women! And those who were just ones who'd come forward. The school took down the pictures and got rid of the flowers people had left. Some people were saying they were glad he were dead. Those were the people that gave me dirty looks when I passed them in the hallway. Whatever. It didn't matter. I didn't know what had really happened with the painting. But I decided to just let sleeping dogs lie. No Thinking about it hurt. Anyway, I eventually went back to the gallery owner to apologise for my outbursts. She smiled and told me I had a good heart. As I was leaving, I could hear the faint sounds of her talking to someone. You seem to really like it. Why don't you take it home with you? A big black dog, rearing on its hind legs to stand like a human. One paw was conspirationally placed in front of its lips, as though swearing the viewer to uphold the shared secret. I hadn't given the painting a second thought, except maybe to remind myself not to bump into it while stumbling down the hall at night to use the bathroom. The painting had never been there growing up, but there had been a lot of changes around my parents' house since I moved out to college. 
I had to throw a sleeping bag on the floor of my old room to visit now, since they had converted the space into a home gym. All the fantasy novels that I used to read were in boxes in the garage, and any games I hadn't brought with me were tossed. It was understandable, I guess. I've moved on with my life, and it would be selfish not to expect them to do the same. It just felt weird sleeping in that room, with the ghosts of my former life replaced by the looming silhouettes of exercise machines. This is where I'd become who I am filling journals with rambling thoughts, laying awake, dreaming of my first crush, studying and stressing and fighting with private demons that my life once revolved around. That's probably why I couldn't sleep. I felt like I'm too young to have that many memories. But here they all came rushing back. I lay awake wondering if that kid was still alive in me somewhere, or whether he was already dead and replaced by a new person, a stranger that I hadn't even properly met. I used to imagine becoming someone that no one could ever forget, but I'm already in college and still a nobody. Was I the person I dreamed about back then? Or had I betrayed myself somewhere along the way? After tossing and turning on the floor for a few hours, I got up to use the bathroom. I had to stop and stare as I passed the painting of the dog. Savage strokes of thick paint made the fur look like it was bristling. Bared, teeth flashed in the moonlight behind its paw and the playful personification of its stance now seemed like a sardonic mockery of human achievements. The longer I stared, the more sure I was this wasn't the same painting I had seen in the day. I passed it again the next morning, on my way to breakfast, but I couldn't comprehend it. What I had found so unsettling during the night, its fur wasn't bristling, it was just fluffy, and those teeth. I could still see them, but it was obviously a smile. I asked my parents about it, but they both just gave me confused looks and little shrugs. Somehow, they both figured the other one had brought it. They'd been doing a lot of home improvement projects, and I guess neither one of them had mentioned it to each other. Eventually, they decided that they couldn't even remember a time where it wasn't there, and they told me it must have been hanging since I was growing up, and that I must have been the one who forgot. The part of me that was worried about everything changing actually found that a relief, if I was already starting to forget. Then maybe these superficial changes weren't so important. Everything from my childhood had meant something to me, that had defined me, while well, those I would have remembered and taken with me. Everything that had changed, everything I forgot. Those were the things that were okay to leave behind. But some things are impossible to leave, no matter how hard you try. I fell asleep easily enough that night, although I awoke with a start at a scratching sound. A dark shape was standing over me. I strained against the confines of the sleeping bag, ripping it aside to leap to my feet. No, just the handlebars of the treadmill. I tried to settle back down, but there was a scratching again. It sounded like it was coming from inside the walls. Could it be mice? Then a long, slow, tearing sound, like a knife running through thick cloth. Not mice, definitely not mice. I turned on the light and walked along the length of the wall. It was uncomfortable to imagine something running around inside, but the scratching seemed too far off for that. This wasn't from inside the wall. This was from the other side, footsteps. I opened the door, 
flipping on the light in the hallway. A black flash of movement around the corner, just at the edge of my vision. I rubbed my eyes. The painting was face down on the carpet. That must have been the sound I heard. The nail losing its grip on the wall probably made the scratching. And then the thump as it hit the floor. I convinced myself that the flash of movement was nothing more significant than the shadow of the treadmill. Until I set the painting up right against the wall. There was a long slash down the center of the canvas. But I couldn't have cared less about the defacement of the art. The fact that the dog was missing from the painting is what gripped me. I scrutinized the canvas, even looking under the folded flaps that the rips had produced. Nothing, just heavy brush strokes of thick blue paint. Scratching, scratching, a crash from the other side of the house where my parents slept. I started running towards the noise, but the next sound had me frozen. A wolf's howl, close from somewhere inside the house. Then shouting from my parents, and I was running again, tearing, growling, and another howl. I flung open the door, and there was blood everywhere. On the walls, on the floor, even the ceiling fan was dripping. Neither of them had been able to get out of bed before their throats were torn out, one brutal bite each, as quick and painless as it can be. And then there was another howl. It sounded like it was coming from outside, through the broken window, howling, but more distant now, seemingly moving away. It must have known I was there. The room was closer to it than anything. If this is what it came here to do, then why didn't it touch me? I ran to the window where I saw a dark shape looking back at the house. Nothing more than a shadow, really standing on its hind legs like a human. It was looking right at me, almost like it was waiting for me to see it. Then it was gone, falling onto all fours to bound into the trees behind the house. I don't know what gave me the courage to follow it that night. It didn't seem like who I was up to this point, but I guess it was up to us to decide who we are from here. My dad had a handgun that he kept at his desk, and he taught me to use it. I didn't know whether I was going to even find it, I just knew that I wanted to kill something. As long as I kept thinking about the kill, I wouldn't have to think about the dead. Staying here and facing their bodies, or even just the inescapable thoughts in my head, that's what I wasn't brave enough to do. Either it didn't expect me to follow or didn't care if I did. The creature made no attempts to cover its tracks. At points, the way seemed deliberately marked with streaks of blood trampled under bush, and even the occasional gash torn straight into a tree. It wasn't too far into the woods when the tracks abruptly stopped though. The deep footprints vanished like it had taken flight. The wilderness was pristine. I turned into slow circles, encompassing with the impossibility of the peaceful night. And with the stillness came the desperate, unbidden thoughts. The confusion, the disbelief, the helpless rage, blood pounding in my veins, breath like a dagger of cold air. I fired the gun randomly at the trees again and again just to drown out the chaos in my mind, and the rustling of something further in reacting to my shot. It was running now, and I was right behind. I didn't care what it was, I was going to shoot it. Even killing a helpless animal would help. I just needed an outlet, any outlet for this turmoil inside. I reached a vantage point over a sudden indenture in the ground and caught a glimpse. Black, shaggy, running on two feet. The dog, the monster, whatever it was. I took another wild shot, but then it was gone again. I fired several more rounds into the woods randomly, but nothing else moved after that. It was gone. 
for good this time. It wasn't a complete loss though, because the last chase had led me to something like a campsite. The remains of a small fire, a few cans of food, a rolled mat on the ground. This wasn't an animal lair, strangers still. I found drying bushes and a small stack of framed paintings on the ground. They were all original, all depicting standing dogs with their paws raised to their mouth. Beside these were an equal number of identical frames, each containing nothing but plain background which matched that of the dogs. There was only one conclusion I was able to draw from this. There's a killer who is deliberately trying to trick people. First comes the dog painting, either given or sold or installed, I don't know. Then he sneaks in to replace the painting with the torn background, looking as if the dog has disappeared. He must need to leave someone alive to spread the tale of the supernatural painting. Although, I still haven't figured out a reasonable motive behind this. Maybe there's no reason to killing. Maybe killing is the reason. I don't know. I could only imagine how terrifying this must be for someone who wasn't able to track the painting's origin, and how powerful the killer must feel reducing someone to that point to take someone's family and destroy their concept of reality in a single blow. There was almost something elegant about the senseless savagery, even if they never told another soul about what they'd seen. That kind of experience would haunt someone for the rest of their life. To have that strong an impact on someone, or multiple someones, to be the most important person in their life without even knowing who you are. But you'd know, wouldn't you? Do something like that, and you'd really know who you are. No one could ever take that away from you. All these paintings left, and the killer wouldn't be back now that his secret has been had. Almost seems like a waste. Or maybe he's just relieved. A secret like that burning inside can eat somebody up. I couldn't have blamed him even if he led me to his campsite on purpose. People like us. Sometimes, we just want our work to be appreciated. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you liked this different and interesting topic. Some awesome stories here by very talented No Sleep writers. If you're interested in reading more from these incredible authors, check out their links in the description. I really hope you did enjoy today's video, and if you did, it would mean a lot to me if you would drop a like and a comment, as it goes a long way in helping more people with a taste for horror find my channel, and helps me grow. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell icon to be up to date with everything I post. If you'd like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit, which can of course be found in the description. Please make sure to include as much punctuation, descriptive language, and paragraphing as possible to maximise the chances of your stories being read. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.